Hey pals, we believe in the value for value model. If you receive value from the Go With The Heat crew, we encourage you to give us a little value back. Go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash go with the heat to find out more. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 7, titled Asian Cut. It originally premiered on January 13th, 1989. We're in a new year. <laughs> yeah. Confetti <laughs> falls from the ceiling. 89 was a terrible year, by the way, so just putting it out there. <laughs> I hope no one you know was born that year. <laughs> I stand by my original <laughs> statement. The writer for this episode is Robert Ward, who also wrote Redemption in Blood, who we just saw, you know, you few, know just like a few weeks ago. <laughs> He's got eight more episodes coming he's gonna write eight more episodes this season i don't know how i feel about that i'm <laughs> i'm torn <laughs> i was torn when we first stopped watching this episode but now i have some time to think about it i actually really liked it because it has like a classic noir story where yeah it's true. A double double cross yeah it's a double double yeah i <laughs> liked it but i do have a little bit of a pet peeve at the end yeah yeah so perfect perfect because that's when vice is at its best the director is james contner this is the only episode he ever directed but he was also the director of photography for Crime Story. Really? Hmm. Well, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Mm, yeah. yeah. Before we get started, I could check I into... I wonder if any of the guest stars will show <laughs> up in Crime Story. Before we get started, I could check into who's going to each other's lives. Guys, we actually want to say a big thank you to everyone who's been following us. We have been doing the show for quite a while now, but we have a sudden surge in the subscribers, not just to the podcast, but to our Twitter and Instagram. This might sound like a shameless plug. <laughs> like, hey, you should go check those things out. I'm not going to stop you. I mean, if, if you want to you do it, go do, you should do like, it. Yeah, you should go do that. You should go to that <laughs> website. And you can find all the all the places you can find us. But there has been a big surge. So it's just like, say, hey, hi, everyone. Hey. hey. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for hey. giving us a listen. Have you seen Tubbs, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you're just joining us or actually you've joined us recently, here's some things that you should know. A, we're still looking for Tubbs Jr. B, who is Manny? And we want <laughs> help finding out who Manny is. We have a, a reward for anyone who can help us find and put us in contact with Manny. If you played Manny, we yes. would love to have you on the show. Yes, we will buy you a sandwich because I'm sure you're probably not doing very well. <laughs> Well, speaking of people who like the wheel and deal for money, let's go talk about some prostitutes that make an appearance in this episode. It's been a while since we talked about prostitutes, guys. Back to our bread and butter hey. prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> and where else are we going to start? On Hooker Row. Let's go talk about it. When we open up, ooh, a sexy party. Not a normal party, a sexy, a sexy party. party. Kind of like the eyes oh, wide yeah. shut kind of sexy party going on here. Man walking around with hey, a look, camera. Guys, Heckman is still alive. A man's walking around. He's got a camera around his neck. He spies another man and takes his picture. <laughs> you know, because that's what they let you do at sex parties. Take, Take pictures. pictures. <laughs> They're all over that. Uh huh. That's part yeah, of the one. Pre- he does not like he fits in there. And two. He's going to get beat up taking pictures of people in their little <laughs> togas and stuff. <laughs> I mean, that ties right into what our, our pre-Super Show was talking about. Like, they let you bring cameras in a strip club? Because apparently, <laughs> according to this episode, they do. <laughs> the questions we ask each other before we get started. <laughs> hey, guys, you know in strip clubs, do they let you bring cameras in? <laughs> ask it for a friend. I just want to know. <laughs> Two ladies are talking. One of them asks the other, how much money do you make doing this? And she says, so I make $150 an hour being an escort to these kind of parties. I can make up to $2,000 a week. And the second hooker, who we find out later, is Sandy, who's a key part of the story. She's like, damn, I'm not getting paid enough by my pimp. I am really getting left out of the cold here. <laughs> $2,000 a month? Mm-hmm. Frank needs to pay her better. It's like good old-fashioned networking. It's kind of talking to each other, working the party, finding out who makes what, who they work for. The lady, the first lady, I think her name was Angela. She's the one that's going to get killed at the end of this, right? Yes. She says... You should get in contact with Cheryl Stone, my boss, that that she'll be able to take care of you. The famous last words. <laughs> Enter the creepiest bald guy you could ever you could ever imagine. He kind of looked like Christopher Lloyd from uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know, at the end. <laughs> there's a bunch of creepy looking dudes in this because there's that guy who's clearly wearing shoulder pads and a suit that's like five times too big for him. But then little teeny tiny sunglasses, like the ones that just barely cover your eyeballs. <laughs> and uh-huh. then Sandy spies another man. And she's like, oh, my God, I got to go. And she runs off. And the man gives chase after 
to her, trying to apologize to her and catch her, but Sandy runs out the door. Outside, the duo are watching, and Trudy's walking down the street. The man with the camera comes walking by. I find out later his name's Stuart, and the duo know him. He's a reporter, a, kind of a swarmy reporter that they don't like. Sonny doesn't like anyone in the press. It doesn't matter what they do. He doesn't yeah, like Yeah, he, he calls him a poor man to Oscar Wilde. Way to be up on the modern references, Sonny. He always is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then another man grabs Trudy and tries to take her away, like takes her down into an alley, holds her up against the wall, like aggressively. He's going to rape her right there. And then the duo come running up and save Trudy. And the man says, quote, I was trying to help her learn how to defend herself. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> Impromptu yeah, no demonstration. One, no one gets handy with no one gets handsy with Trudy. I mean, she's Tubbs and Crockett's girl. Like, <laughs> like, they're her pimp. They handcuff the man. Trudy takes him away, and then Crackhead Willie comes walking out <laughs> of the woods. That's actually his name, Crackhead Willie. <laughs> he comes out babbling about seeing a big man with a fin, and the duo are ready to write him off. Whatever, I don't know what oh. you're talking about. And then he they, says, "They are trying so hard to ignore him. Come on, dude, we don't need the paperwork. Just let us leave." And, <laughs> and he funny that with the with the whole oh, and there's a knife, and and Crockett's like. Son of a bitch. <laughs> we actually got to go right, follow where up is on she? this. He takes them on a tour about, uh, around Hooker <laughs> Row down there in Miami. And eventually he gets to a door. The duo go inside. And they see a woman dead, stabbed to death, carved. Guys, like things carved into her skin. And Sonny just says, oh, man, bum, not again. Bum, bum. <laughs> not all this paperwork I have to do. <laughs> Means another Vice episode uh, where they're going to be homicide cops, too. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, this one, we like to check in with the guest stars. John, some of these people looked familiar, but not because I've seen them in other things, but because I've seen them specifically in other Vice episodes. <laughs> Let's start with a few of our Jordan Vice guest stars. We have Carrie Hiroyuki Tagawa, who first appeared as Kenji Fujitsu in the episode Rising Death. I know him best from Mortal Kombat because he played Shang Tsung, but he was also in like the... Mark Wahlberg, Planet of the Apes movie, more video game movies. He was in uh, his most recent role was 2010's Tekken. Random movie, he was also in Twins. <laughs> Breakthrough role was in 87's The Last Emperor. He mm. also had a regular role in the first season of Nash Bridges. Oh. Sonny takes care of his people. Oh, sorry, not mm -hmm. Sonny. Don Johnson. Yeah, he Don does. Johnson oh, yeah. takes takes care of his people. Recent TV work in a couple episodes of, of the new Hawaii Five-0. Let's keep on the trend here with people we've seen in ice before. We have the vice veteran Alfredo Alvarez Calderon. He plays Carlos Escobar. You might also know him as playing characters... Eduardo Vasquez in B Baby Blues. Mm -hmm. He played Lewis in Deliver Us from Evil. <laughs> and coming soon to a vice screen <laughs> near you, he will play Caesar Montoya in Free Fall. Oh, Whoa. he's going to make it in the last episode. Damn. Oh, yeah. And then we also have Julie Brams back. She played Miss Frank Hackman in Deliver Us from Evil. She plays Sandy Dyson in this one, a hooker. And soon she will play Rita Lombard in the upcoming episode World of Trouble. So hmm. from mob boss to hooker to mob boss's, I'm sorry, mob boss's wife to hooker to mob boss's wife. I didn't even notice that it was the same person in this case, actually. Normally I do recognize them. I'm like, oh, I think that person was in this episode, but I didn't recognize her. I didn't even recognize her that she was the same one in the Delivers from Evil that she was in the, the first episode with Hackman. Yeah. I didn't even notice it was her. I, uh, uh, maybe I didn't recognize her because she wasn't running away being shot in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to a few of our vice virgins here. We have <laughs> David Scram, who played Professor Howell. He's best known for playing Roy Biggins on the TV show Wings from 1990 to 97. I was like, what is he from? Yeah. 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 See, he's not so creepy. He's still he's creepy. He's a funny fat guy. <laughs> He also he's also appeared in some pretty big stage productions uh, and was also the founding member of the acting company. He's a Juilliard graduate, like he's like like acting thespian type stuff. But just a few other movie credits aside from his run on Wings, he was in '89's Let It Ride, also in '89 Johnny Handsome, and in 1990 A Shock to the System. Not a whole lot. Since Wings, let's just... If I have to guess, 
he yes. wasn't actually playing Johnny Handsome. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Maybe he played the bad guy, ugly. I don't know. All right, so we also have Russell Horton, who plays Stuart Whitley. He was an actor on CBS's Radio Mystery Theater from 74 to 82, but he's kind of more notable for being a voice actor. For years, he voiced the Trix Rabbit in Trix commercials. He is famous, then. <laughs> Unaware that tricks are for kids. <laughs> he also voiced characters in the video games Red Dead Revolver and Red Dead Re Redemption. He has been in a couple movies, Annie Hall and Bright Lights Big City, as well as a couple other TV guest appearances, but mostly known as the Church Rabbit. So then obviously that's what his memoir will be about. It's about being the church <laughs> rabbit. So that brings us to Steve Ryan, who plays Mr. Dyson. So I just wanted to throw this out there. His first movie he appeared in was called Night of the Juggler. <laughs> His first TV appearances was Attica, the TV movie. And I promised just in the open, other TV credits include 27 episodes of Crime Story, five episodes of Wise Guy, some New York Undercover, Five more episodes of Oz, nine episodes of daddy -O, and 16 episodes of West Wing. Unfortunately, he died in 2007 after a long illness at the age of 60, so he will be missed. I don't care what anyone says. A juggler is scary. People who juggle, like, not just for fun, but for a career. Like, there's something wrong with those people. Guest Stars is pretty much done, but I'm going to throw... I just want to throw this out there because uh, I thought this guy's name was interesting. He's kind of one of the, uh, you know, like, policeman number three. I loved his name. So he plays the character of Otis, and his name <laughs> is Spider Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I have questions. Not Spider-Man. Spider Martin. <laughs> I have questions. Spider-Man's conservative cousin, <laughs> Martin. <laughs> Do they name the random characters in the back? I think she's like policeman number three and stuff like that. But no, this guy's actually got a name. His name is Otis. Yes. <laughs> yes. He actually played Otis in the episode. And if you think Otis is a funny name, it's played by, he is played by Spider Martin. <laughs> When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. Stan, the duo, and Trudy are talking to dad. Gina comes in, says the lady who's killed, her name was Angela Nelson. She was obviously a hooker. Dad says that there's been four people have died now. So now everyone's split up. Gina is going to go check good, in with the pimp. Good Lord. Do you see that outfit on Trudy? <laughs> Checkers in every color of the rainbow. That is just, that is an amazing outfit. If Tubbs is always looking his best wearing a, like a three-piece suit, then Trudy's always the one that looks like the most outlandish. The homicide reports in and says that she was tortured, obviously, because all the stuff carved into her, and then got found by Willie, and then he killed her. Crackhead Willie, if you forgot, that's what his <laughs> name was. Dad says Trudy and Rico go work the pimp angle and try and find out who the Johns were that go pick up his girls. Stan, get a rush on the wire. Sonny, you stay here. Don't you go nowhere. I got something to show you. Everyone leaves, and Sonny's got that nervous <laughs> look on his eye. Like, I don't know. What like, I do? <laughs> this isn't another Burnett thing. I thought we were past this. Dad shows That's him where pictures. I never killed anyone today. Dad shows him pictures of the cuts on the body and says, well, what, what do you think of these? Sonny says, they're clearly Asian symbols, but we don't know from where. Looks like it's some sort of ritual. And Dad says, okay, well, go check around with, with other departments to see if they have any ritualistic killers. Everybody does. <laughs> so then that leads us to the professor who's just way too into this, you know, and he's looking at these symbols. It's all excited. And he's like, this one says cat. Like, this one <laughs> says shoes. <laughs> he does recognize the cuts. And he says that they're definitely Japanese. And they're associated with some storm goddess, which I didn't write the name down, but it had an amazing name. <laughs> but yeah, he's just reading about this. Uh, I mean, here, now I'll show you the book. He was literally just <laughs> reading about these cuts. I was not practicing these yeah. last night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a coincidence. Uh, he says that they let the body the body bleed slowly so that they'll bleed. The, and then uh, that, that's how they die. It's a very old ritual that they perform. And then the professor says the moon is some sort of crest and he'll you look into see, it a little I have bit some more. <laughs> <laughs> Over at an office, Trudy and Rico are there to see Mr. Dyson. Mr. Dyson is a man from the very beginning who chases after Sandy. We're going to find out right now that that's his daughter who ran away and he's been looking for her. She ran away when she was 18. She's now a prostitute. So then it's like, okay, well, we want to find out more information from you because your daughter was there at Razor's Edge that night and also 
you were there at Razor's mm-hmm. Edge that night too. So and that question never comes up. Mm-hmm. Why, Why were was you there? He at <laughs> Razor's Edge? Uh, no, I was distracted the whole time because we have Trudy's dress and then now Tubbs shirt. <laughs> it's too he's, much color. He's desperate to find his daughter that she was with Angela Nelson that night. So the woman that got killed. And Tub says, this sounds really serious. How about you go do some more talking with Trudy? You two leave now. And yeah, Trudy, Trudy, you do all the work. You take all the information down from this schlub. <laughs> I'm done with him. <laughs> Rico gets a call. It's Gina to say that a man, a man named Lester Cope wants to meet up with them. Then Tub says, okay, fine. Have Stan meet me there. And so they're off to go talk to a man named Lester. At the park, they find Lester, who's just like hop skipping around the park, checking out all the ladies. <laughs> and he's the pimp. For Angela Nelson, I think is what this is about. Or I'd say, pimp yeah, that yeah, but he's just her pimp. For. He really doesn't know her very well. <laughs> like they don't hang out. He's just a business thing, you know. He he just runs the street. And... He tries to run when he when Tubbs comes up to him, but Stan catches him with the old open the car door. You trip over <laughs> the door trick. That's that's ma- magic. Took some practice. So many random people on the street got tripped up by the door. (laughs) They start to threaten Lester and he caves immediately and says there's a big time Japanese dealer named Tagoro who took the girl. He's a sick dude. Uses knives to like mix up. He doesn't say specifically what he does (laughs) with the knives. He whittles. (laughs) (laughs) Trained by this guy, Kenji Fujitsu. <laughs> Back on Hooker Row, Trudy sees Sandy Dyson. She's working the street. She sees Sandy also working. A cop car drives by, so all the girls go running for an alley to hide. And they hide together hide in the same spot. And that's Trudy introduces herself as Cookie. Now, I love Trudy's hooker name. <laughs> it's perfect. I love her hooker voice. I was waiting do for John to do the impression. Her... Yeah, I know. We were waiting for the voice to actually come out. <laughs> Oh, oh no no i don't think i know that that octave but <laughs> but yeah she does this like i don't know like kind of ditzy kind of just kind of a ditzy kind of voice you know but it's weird that she actually kind of does an impression or a voice when she's undercover as a hooker because i mean they don't really know her from anyone so yeah like, she does like a jersey girl kind of voice she strikes up a conversation with sandy and sandy says hey you got a coffee there i'd love to have some of your coffee can i have a sip and then Trudy's like, no, nah, here, you can just have the whole thing. And then Cookie says, are you the same Sandy that some old dude is looking for? And Sandy says, yeah, it's my dad. I've been trying to get away from him for a long time. Cookie says, "That's tr- I can understand that. I never got along with my dad either. And Sandy says, well, the only person her dad ever went after was her. Oh. So who's the real bad guy? Yeah, here? wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Out at Tagoro's place, Sonny and Tubbs are there to go talk to him. They're moving fast, by the way. Like This is all like, in the same day, and everyone's like splitting up the different partners and stuff like that. Tubbs is with Stan, and then he's with Sonny, and then he was with Trudy in the morning. And it's like, he's all over the place. He's working with everybody on this case. They go to see Tagoro, and he's like a weird conceptual artist that puts knives into statues that look like parts of people. Sonny comes in and immediately cat knocks one of the <laughs> Statues off the table. Tagara's like, man, like, hey, I, I was told that was art. <laughs> Sonny shows him the picture, and Tagaro says, I don't know who that is. I don't know nothing from nobody. Sonny's taking it very personally that Tagoro won't cooperate with him. It gets right up in his face. He says, I know you're at Razor's Edge. And Tagoro says, yeah, of course I was. I like it because it's sharp. No, lies, lies. Tagoro wasn't at Razor's Edge. Tagoro was at a combat tournament. It's a legitimate tournament. It's called Mortal. Mortal Combat. <laughs> That's the step right before the Kumite. <laughs> He picks up a knife out of one of the statues, and Sonny says, I'm going to get you, sucker. <laughs> and Tagoro t- throws the knife into one of the statues. I have a question. Sonny came in and immediately knocked my statue over and it shattered on the floor. And then when Tagoro threw the knife, it like went into like foam. Yeah, so how did that work? <laughs> hmm. I have a question. The chick wearing the mask and the leather in the corner, what did they walk in on? What kind of freaky stuff was going on before they walked in there? I mean, are they not regular police? Are they not going to make sure she's, she's okay? okay yeah, are you stuff? all right? <laughs> Later that night at a hotel or an apartment, I'm not sure exactly where it is. I think it's a hotel or is it at that warehouse? I think it's at that warehouse we end up at at the end. Yeah, Sandy's there. She's in one of the, some other room and she gets a call from Carlos who says, I want to see you now. 
she walks down the hall. She's very tentative. She like reluctantly walks down the hallway. She's very scared about what's going to happen. She goes into the room. It's dark. There's a camera flash. And then someone grabs her and she screams. And then when we come back, it's the next day. And dad's there with Gina and Mr. Bison, Sandy's dad. And the ID, Sandy, who's now dead, has been carved up like the other girls. Dad sends Rico with the dad to go get her stuff at her place like her apartment or whatever and rico stops to talk to trudy who's got daggers for dyson rico says hey what's going on you know something that i don't know and she says well dyson isn't exactly father of the year which i think in cop speak they told each other like multiple paragraphs of things things yeah that but yeah, it all got i know out of one sentence and, and i love how blunt rico is he immediately leaves here to go with the dad and like as soon as they get alone he's like, so you're a terrible dad <laughs> <laughs> You know, Sonny. <laughs> Dyson doesn't. He says, I've been to therapy and I'm a changed person. And I'm just trying to be a dad now. Trying well, to make up for lost time. Well, I think that's, that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tubbs isn't buying it either. Tubbs then finds Sandy's diary. And the last entry says that she wanted to work for someone named Cheryl Stone. Tub says, all right, Mr. Child Molester, I'm leaving. I'm taking this diary with me. Literally, yeah. that was worth I mean, we don't know what it actually said because he kind of summarizes it. It could have said, dear diary, tricking is hard. I learned, about, <laughs> uh, I learned about flavored condoms today. Oh, yeah, I work for this new lady now. So now Tubbs and Gina are going to go see Cheryl. So Tubbs just is an all-encompassing partner. He just yeah, works with everybody. everybody. He's everywhere tonight, man. <laughs> they want to see the records of her Johns, which is just it's just the wrong show for you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this right right now. They're legitimate hookers here. <laughs> That's what she says. <laughs> yeah. Gina says, files and everything. Gina says, we'll see what the DA has to say about that. Cheryl then gives in and says, so Sandy's only working with me for a few days. And like, I don't know. She's not really much of a hooker. It's like her heart just doesn't seem like it's in it. So I don't know how much longer I was going to keep her around. And Tub says, well, it's fine because she's, she's dead. dead yeah. And then Cheryl goes, Do you think oh. that she does performance reviews with her hookers? <laughs> like, it just doesn't seem like you're trying lately. Uh, we're going to put you on probation. Hand jobs only uh, for the next week. <laughs> I want to see some effort. <laughs> Both hands this time. <laughs> <laughs> when Cheryl finds out that Sandy's dead, she's like, oh, man, not, not again. Yeah, not another one. Even after I lost yeah. Angela Nelson uh -huh. already. So now at Sandy's apartment, Dyson is still there. And then Stuart comes in. The photographer from the very beginning who's at the club who took a picture of Tegoro. He also talked to Sonny, which we kind of breezed over at the precinct where Sonny tells him to take a hike, hit the road, pal. We ain't got no room for you here. Even though he says, I may know who killed the, uh, the, what, who's doing these killings. And it turns out he's right, because then he'll get killed by that same person at the end, because he doesn't have any mm -hmm. police support. <laughs> when Dyson lets him in, Stewart then says, Okay, I, I'm a reporter for the New York Times. I think I might know who killed your daughter. Oh, oh, well, no. At first, he pretends to be a priest. Yeah, yeah. He comes in as a priest. And as soon as he gets in there, he immediately says, oh, actually, because he starts taking a thousand photos. Yeah, as soon room. as he gets in the room, he starts taking pictures. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. At the precinct, Big Booty Trudy sitting at her desk. It just says right in the middle of the screen. Big yeah. Booty Trudy. <laughs> I smell an undercover sting coming on. Gina, Trudy, <laughs> get your clear heels. <laughs> We're going hooking. Gina calls and says that the waiter at Razor's Edge said that Segura was with a guy named Carlos. So now they can kind of like piece Carlos with Angela Nelson and that knows how knows Sonny. They tell the vice team and Sonny says, why use the same service twice? Like why get, why kill hookers from the same place? Because they had a coupon. Tub says that it must be Tagoro and he's just playing with them. He knows like in their conversation at his place where he kind of plays coy about cutting people up. And he's just playing with them. So their only option now is, is, of course, set Trudy up as a prostitute to get picked up by Tagoro. And then they can try and rush in and save her at the last minute. Which, why does Trudy always have to be the bait? Also, in the beginning of the episode, That's they, wanted, I know. they wanted Trudy and Rico to work the hooker and pimp angle. How come? How come those two together? I'm just saying. It's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, you were saying while we were watching the episode, like he... The killer clearly has a type. Yeah, and it's not it's not Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I could yeah, say. I was looking at the same thing because it was 
I mean, going all the way back to the first season when Trudy was tied to the chair with like the bomb, it's always her that gets kidnapped or kidnapped by the serial killer or something. I mean, I guess I can see from their perspective, they want to see the killer stay alive because if they send Gina, she's just going to kill him. <laughs> He'll never make Very it to true. that point. Gina is a serial killer herself. So. <laughs> So now I don't know where they are. I think they're at Cheryl's to do the sting where they where they're answering the phone. So Gina answers the phone yeah. in her best sultry voice. Yeah, what was with that? <laughs> I don't know, but it kind of works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, five hundred dollars in cash, no, no no checks, no no pay rolls, <laughs> no pay. <laughs> so just that, style five 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 dirty talk. You can talk to live <laughs> girls who just want to talk to you. <laughs> a man named Carlos calls, oh, just the person that they're waiting for, and he wants a girl for later that night. Gina sets her up with Trudy and gives him Trudy's number, and then they can immediately listen to because of the wire on Tr- Trudy's number. They listen to the phone call and says, okay, I want you to come meet me at the Bayview Hotel tonight at 9 o'clock. So now the sting is set up. They think they got Carlos. This is like, I feel terrible for Trudy here. <laughs> I feel worse for this than what happens at the end. What? <laughs> yes, I do. It's at the Bayview Hotel. <laughs> Rico and Trudy come pull it up. Trudy's nervous because she's got no backup inside and with someone who they think is a murderer. Yeah, like she's she's going to every- walk in and they're going to murder her. Like, uh-huh. She's got every reason to be nervous. And I mean, you've seen Carlos, the creepiest bald guy that they could get. And she's going to have to go up by herself with this guy and pretend to like be all into him. Yeah, um, and Rico's just going to sit in the car outside listening to the wire while on the phone with Stan, who's keeping an eye on the razor's edge. Tubbs and Stan are just going to sit around and bullshit while Trudy has to go to work. Stan sees the Tagoros at the club, so they don't, they don't know what's happening here with Carlos, who's clearly in cahoots with Tagoro, as far as they know. And then they hear on so the wire... Turns out, so turns Trudy, Trudy gets out the car and goes upstairs with him, and turns out Carlos... Is just in the market for a new dominatrix. <laughs> he shows her his rhino hide, asks her to touch it, maybe stroke it a little, <laughs> give him a couple spanks. <laughs> <laughs> they listen to the wire and they think, okay, this is it. Like, he's going to make a move on Trudy. We're, we're, we're going to move in. Tubbs, get ready. And Tubbs doesn't do anything. Yeah, he's like, he is- okay, I'm still listening. Don't worry. <laughs> Hold on. This is getting good now. I can't, get, I can't go in yet. Yeah. <laughs> And and then like, Carl- like, yeah, smack that ass. <laughs> and then Carlos turns around and puts his hands into like some like handcuffs that are like up on the wall, straps that are up on the wall. And then Trudy has to whip him because she's undercover as a prostitute. So that means like he wants to be whipped. And so now she has to do it. And also like be concerned, yeah, like he's not concerned on to get violence. I mean, she has to do it right. She can't just be like, okay, like whatever. He yeah, I know because he might be mad, like you're not really mm-hmm. into this. Well, also yeah, we don't know what else happened either. Because the and just because the scene ends doesn't mean it didn't have to go further. Exactly. I'm just that, saying. Yeah, that's exactly what, He's what in did he handcuffs have to do? getting whipped. Something might have been introduced later. You might remember from previous episodes, someone tried to give it to Crockett. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, so who knows what she actually had to do before she got out of there? She she might have had to go all the way. Yeah, because just keep her cover oh, yeah. and Carlos Curly isn't a murderer. No. So what does she do? And everyone just sits back and listens to what Trudy has to go through. And we're not there yet because there's one other important scene which I want to point out right now. Like at the precinct the next day, she is not right. Well, would you be? <laughs> exactly. So you, could you imagine what creepy stuff that guy was into? Yeah, he's talking about how pain. I didn't is see any, but there could have been there could have been small animal ages. Like I don't, I don't know what was all in that apartment. <laughs> there was all kinds of random stuff. What we skipped over, I'm gonna come back to now, is that at Razor's Edge, Dyson comes walking in, and now there's some panics. Like, why is Dyson here? I just saw Stan sees him go inside. Dyson walks straight up to Tagoro and says. This is for my daughter, points the gun at the girl, but then doesn't pull the trigger, turns and shoots the bodyguard, who then also shoots Dyson, and then he's dead. Tagoro leaves, Stan comes running in and sees Dyson is just on the ground. Another question here. If you are on a suicide mission to go kill the man who you think murdered your daughter while she was being a prostitute, do you stop to shoot his protection, or you just go in there and shoot that person in the head? Yeah, a little weird that he went for the bodyguard. So, turns out, bad move. <laughs> you know? <laughs> His plan was flawed. Let's put it that way. Yeah, even yes. if you were going to get shot, like he was, like I was saying, like he's going in for a suicide mission. 
So you're undeterred. You just walk straight up to Javoro and pull the trigger. Whatever happens after that, like you, you're gonna murder someone in cold blood. So you're gonna. Who cares if you die at that point, right? Like that's what that's what his mentality is. So his first mistake was announcing why he was there to kill him. He should just shot him. Like, just, just go walk up and shoot, and shoot him. him. <laughs> I feel like it's a bad look that Stan got there after everyone had already left. You know, considering he's just across the club. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. Uh... But I also gotta give him kudos for not shooting through the club. At them, you know, like Crockett would have. That's what I'm saying here is that I'm very disappointed in Dyson, not as a father, and how his <laughs> his inability to get stuff done, but also coming off the heels of Burnett. Does no one know about this mass murdering person named Burnett that didn't ask any questions, just walked up and shot people in the face? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Out at the university, the the next day, the professor still got nothing. He's talking to Tubbs and Castillo because Tubbs is seriously working with everybody on this case. Stewart comes walking up and he wants to talk to the professor, but Tubbs cockboxes him, says, yeah, you don't want to talk to this guy. He's just a swarmy slime ball. All but true. another sign that Stewart was on the right case, that a journalist had figured it out and was following all the leads, unlike the police officers. Castillo. <laughs> He's the one that brought him in. Well, they got Castillo. They got Castillo as soon as they carved Asian markings into the prostitutes. Like, that's all he was stuck. He's already in Yakuza land right now. He, he's trying to think up old contacts he can call to find out if people are murdering, were murdering hookers five years ago in Taiwan. At the precinct, Trudy gets a call. It's Carlos. He wants to set it up to do it again. And this is what I'm talking about. The Trudy is just like. She's not right. She should not be at work. Not right. That's how bad she looks. She is uncomfortable talking to mm -hmm. Carlos, but she has to obviously set it up. Says, "Okay, you you know you know, okay, you know the Park Grove Motel. I'll meet you there." And you can just see like it's eating Trudy up from the inside. The Vice Squad has a little powwow about it, and, and they try and justify like, "Well, maybe he's maybe he's got to test her first, which is like, hey guys, kind of mean. Like she's still standing here. Like she had to actually whip." him Let, let's not talk about what what she had to do to test her kind of astounds me is at no point do they think hey guys maybe we're wrong about this maybe there's someone else that could be doing this maybe it's not tigoro even though there's no evidence to show that he was there or anything really it's just like a crazy scheme they came up with stan comes in with more information on carlos he's a former military in vietnam and then he was a mercenary trudy doesn't know anything about the meeting that's going to happen like who else is going to be there tonight is going to meet with her. And Tubbs tries to push it. But Trudy is clearly still struggling. And Tubbs immediately backs off. Out at a different house. And I thought this was Tagoro's at first, but it's not. It's some other house. Stewart, the reporter, is waiting outside. He sees a man leave. We're so far away, we don't see who that man is. We just know that a man leaves. So Stewart comes walking up the house. He breaks in the back door. Stalks around for a while. Digs through the desk. Eventually opens a briefcase and finds a yellow envelope. And the envelope is pictures of the girls dead and the carvings that are in them. You're, so you're assuming that. We never actually saw the pictures. He looks at them and, uh, and reacts to them. So we know that they're racy pictures. But they could just be nudes. I mean, <laughs> what, when you see the guy who they belong to, if they were his nudes, you, you might react the same way. <laughs> but you do actually see, like, at least the first picture because it's, it's uh, is it Sandy dead? Is that mm -hmm. the one? I think that's what it is. But it could also uh -oh. be... Just for continuity here, it could also be the pictures that Dad let the professor exactly. keep. Exactly. You don't know for sure. Yeah. Because he, he did have pictures. So then he thinks he's figured out who the murderer is, that it's this person that lives in this house. I think it's Tagoro's house. He goes to leave. He opens the door. But it's not Tagoro's house. It's the professor. And with him is Carlos. So now we got the bad guy is not the bad guy, but it's really the bad guy. Kind of noir style feel about this. Like where you think it's leading you to the right direction. That the girl's going to get caught. Like our previous porno dealing murderer in the snuff film. Mm -hmm. But then we take a hard mm -hmm. switch to, oh no, it's the person you would think, the last person you would think it was. The person who knew everything about the carvings. <laughs> not exactly the last person I would, I would think it was. I would think that the person who knew about the carvings and not so excited about them. I think they, they'd they be on my suspect list somewhere. <laughs> Stuart tries to say, hey, I, I mean, I was just looking around. Like, I wasn't going to tell anyone about them. I just kind of wanted to keep them for myself. And the professor eventually, after 
pacing around the room and long windedly yes. comes to the point where he says, I learned in a small hut while in Vietnam that the ecstasy people feel in their last moments is worth it. And then Carlos drags Stewart out of the room screaming. He had to kill the reporter. He couldn't let the reporter let it out that he's a killer. Out at the Park Grove Motel, the duo show up to go talk to Trudy that they're really early to get set up for the sting that's going to happen on Carlos now. And she's not there. Doors unlocked and she's not there. They have very little panic in that moment. Yeah, too. I know. They're like, oh, she maybe she's just out picking up some food or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're never really in a hurry to find her. Even after they talk with, I guess, her landlord that just is hanging out in the hall. It's like it's a motel. <laughs> um, so he's like the like front desk guy who's very nosy, apparently, and knows everything. Even when they find out like it was a bald guy with a scar who looked just exactly like Carlos, you know, they're still kind of like, Huh, I don't know why she go without us. <laughs> so the manager comes up and says, oh, she left with the man that fits Carlos's description. Out at the torture palace, so we don't know where that is yet. No, in we the don't episode. know. It's the same setup as with Sandy. They bring Trudy in. It's dark. They take a picture of her right when she comes into the room. But the light then turns on. It's bright enough for her to see. It's the professor sitting in there with Carlos escorting her in. She recognizes him, too. She goes, it's you? <laughs> <laughs> At the precinct, Gina, Dad, Sonny, and Stan are stressing out. They don't. Trudy's missing. She's probably with a murderer. Probably. She's probably <laughs> dead. Rico is busy turning over Carlos's place. He's found nothing. Stan comes with more info on Carlos and says that he worked for Air America. And Sonny's like, oh, that sounds so familiar, Air America. He flips open the professor's book, and in the back, he worked for Air America. Oh, yeah, Carlos worked in the same places and, and during the war at the same places as the professor did. Oh, man, we should probably check mm. into this. So Sonny takes off. Dad. Small world. Screwed up. <laughs> at the torture palace, the, the professor's doing an amazing PowerPoint <laughs> about what torture is and how it affects people. I swear to God, if this room is full of dolls, <laughs> and <laughs> dolls I'm going to strangle someone. <laughs> I, I better well, not be. He is doing this great PowerPoint. There's clapping. He's got a full crowd that's watching him do this presentation. He's got the perfect person to demonstrate what these things are while in his amazing kimono. That does not fit him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, aren't kimonos supposed to be kind of baggy? <laughs> His was a little tight. <laughs> well, you can thank Steven Seagal for changing that. <laughs> Kimonos don't have to be bad. True story. <laughs> He's talking about his mentor, that his mentor is dead, but his legacy lives on. He's going to show everyone how he can do that style of torture on Trudy. At the professor's house, the duo are seriously, talking. Seriously, better, better not be a theater full of dolls. I swear <laughs> to God, Vice. <laughs> mannequins you mean <laughs> at the professor's house the duo are stalking around rico found an address for a warehouse that he leases so that's got to be where he is meanwhile Stuart is hanging from a noose in the backyard yeah like uh hey guys you might want to be around be aware of your surroundings like look around <laughs> look, dead guy guy. hanging there <laughs> i hear they keep the crows away so now out to the torture warehouse in our final scene of the episode. The professor is telling the group that he's going to do the live demonstration. He starts with electrocuting Trudy's feet with like a cattle prod. Pretty sure this is how 8mm ends. <laughs> the will come pulling in and they just, you know, take their time to get Yeah, okay. That was really, like, the other times I'm like, okay, so they don't know where she's at. They're just, but they literally get out of the car and walk out of the car. <laughs> she yeah. could be being yeah, tortured, is. cut up with a knife, carved right now. And your asses are just well, strolling around. Like, <laughs> and what's great, the too, weather? Is, like, we get to hear, like, the crowds. Like, in fact, I think Crockett even reacts to what we think is the crowd clapping. You expect them to bump into a bouncer uh, who's going to charge them, like, a $5 cover charge to get in. And then we jump back to the guy in the state to the professor. He's getting into this. He's I call this one the, the sushi chef. <laughs> they get there. Just in time, as the professor's putting, he puts the cattle pot away, gets an, out a knife, puts it to Trudy's neck. He's explaining to the audience what he's going to do. They come walking up. They yell out to the professor. He takes off, and they have a shootout with Carlos, who's also there. And this is when I'm like, okay, so who's in the crowd? Who's all going to go running? John. <laughs> Damn it, Vice. Mannequins are no different than <laughs> ventriloquist dummies or dolls or whatever the last serial killer had. Come on, man. This is the same ending as the last one. Uh, the only difference is that he's not going to burn all of his mannequins in this one, so no 
no grand suplex. They did get shot in the head, though. <laughs> yes, wipe his brain. <laughs> right away. Also, that's why Carlos is bald, right? Because he just blends in with all the other ones. <laughs> was he the only one clapping then? Because he's the only real person there. <laughs> So it's like his kid like clapping everywhere, like runs over here, claps, like, runs over here. <laughs> it's part of it. <laughs> the show they put on together. But how could he be the one clapping if he's he's got to be the one working the lights and the projector as well? <laughs> he's very talented. It's like Hackman still I working the spotlight. He did work with Hackman. <laughs> Isn't he in that episode with Hackman? <laughs> so there you go. He worked yeah. with him. He knew. Tubbs gives Chase the Carlos. He eventually catches up to him outside. He's like, hey, sucker. And then Carlos turns around and he shoots and kills Carlos. He's like, literally, hey, sucker. <laughs> I love it, dude. <laughs> hey, sucker, look at me. Bam, gotcha. <laughs> Crockett comes running out and he looks over and he, and he sees Tubbs. And Tubbs is like checking his pulse and he like, looks all confused. <laughs> so Sonny had run off. He had cut Trudy out and handed her his ankle gun and said, okay, you just stay here. So she gets up. She's uh-huh. obviously, you know, not right. She's yeah. getting electrocuted. <laughs> and he's just going to leave her alone. Just leave her by herself, you know, because, you know, Trudy's got this. Of course, Trudy has to do all the damn work. The professor comes stumbling in and he sees Trudy. He's got a gun now, too, but he sees Trudy and he starts to try to explain himself that Trudy was perfect, was the perfect fit. And was purposefully chosen for this event. It was supposed to go perfect. He couldn't understand what happened. She's telling him to stop and like to drop the gun. And then eventually she's just tired of it and pumps three bullets into him and he goes down. This is my this is where I have a big problem here. Because this is a common thing with Trudy, is that she drops him. He's tortured her. He's killed other people. He has a gun. He's walking towards her. She drops him like a police officer would. Sonny comes running in, runs to the professor and checks his pulse and gives Trudy the what did you do look. Yeah, he gave her the look when she uh-huh. like when she shot that other guy when she was protecting him. And the time where she shot him protecting Sonny in the previous, like from like season three. Yeah, that's what I'm talking the about. The first time she shot and killed yeah. someone. And then there's also the one that happened in season four where Sonny was walking into a trap. Yep, and she killed someone. And she killed the guy that was mm-hmm. up on the stairs, too. He's like, I can't believe you I can't you believe you did that. You did that. <laughs> it's like you're a cop or something. <laughs> I thought you were just a secretary. <laughs> Sonny, all, I'm, all we're trying to tell you is, is that you don't throw stones in glass houses. You are actually a real murderer. <laughs> I mean, multiple of course. murderers, too. Like, almost could be, almost could be considered course. like a serial yeah. killer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. We just, that's where we end, is that Sonny goes over to Trudy and says, hey, let's go home. And um, then he <laughs> walks her out or take her to the hospital she's been electrocuted <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just thinking at the end of this with trudy is like do you want ptsd because this is how you get ptsd now all the stuff that trudy just went uh-huh. through and you're going to take advantage of the very next op- opportunity to have her be another hooker this episode took a very interesting turn where we went from the professor being so at first i was tagoro then we went to the professor and carlos being the person that's in between the two of them him being the link and that's how they were able to put it together then also though that Stuart was the one that figured it all out they would just listen to the Stuart in the beginning that well, would have been a lot shorter he was such a jerk though but also i have i have a question did did the professor know she was a cop then and he picked her on purpose because she was a cop or no did he not know she was a cop mm, there is there a scene where they're together i don't remember mm. I, I i think trudy's the only one that he hasn't seen so, so when she says it's you he shouldn't know like he shouldn't know that she's a cop then i, I don't so. know I'm, I, I'm i'm questioning that because i didn't see them together no, the professor the professor met with, with crockett and then he met with Tubbs and castillo he never met with any of the ladies if, if i as far as i remember him saying he picked her and everything was just based off her being not that she was uh-huh. a cop or something. it was her ability for whipping Oh, okay. Gotcha. I guess is what they would have chosen, like what he did to Carl, what she did to Carlos. She's really good at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like two full knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that clears it up. I just was confused as to like, it, was it supposed to mean like he knew she was a cop all along and he was still going to torture her to death anyway? Which kind of seems like that might be a little of a gamble. Yeah, yeah that might backfire. Well, if yeah. she never met him, how did she know it, that it was him? Because of the or book. Who him was? Because he wrote that oh. book. That's how they found him, right? That's how Castillo found him. He wrote that did book. He and have he a had, picture, like, picture in the book. Yeah, there's a picture in the book and all that. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, I thought that was Andy Richter. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Leave Andy Richter alone. <laughs> Before we round up all of our final thoughts here, let's go talk about this week's music first. 
It's uh, a little different from last week. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, we've had a few weeks in a row here where we've had some like huge music guests. But this week's a little different. Yeah, just not feeling it, guys. No, no. <laughs> I think we're just going to kind of, you know, kind of kind of run through pretty quick and just try and get it over with. <laughs> uh, we have Under the Milky Way by the church. You might remember the church. The church, they appeared in, in the episode Heart of the Night, which was just a few episodes ago. So, like we were just talking about them. They were an Australian new wave rock band formed in 1980, but Stephen Kilby, singer bass, and Peter Copes, they first played together uh, in the mid 80s in a glam rock band called Baby Grand. You think they wore makeup in Baby Grand? <laughs> they are a glam rock band. I'm sure they did if it's glam rock. I mean, pretty much nothing's changed in, what, two, three episodes? All in all, mainstream success kind of proved elusive for them. They did retain a, a pretty large international cult following. They sold most of their stuff in Australia and Europe. They sold a bit in the U.S., but first, uh, like after their first album, they got signed by a U.S. label, but then their second album sucked, and so the label dropped them <laughs> so but it sold well in australia it totally did but yeah let's not go through all that let's talk about here it is take it by the that petrol emotion you guys know that <laughs> petrol emotion oh yeah everyone knows them yeah, yeah you know they were formed in Dury, northern ireland by john o'neill and uh raymond gorman you know that petrol emotion not the other one <laughs> They released five albums between 1986 and 94. The other members include Sierra McLaughlin. Not Sarah McLaughlin. Sierra <laughs> McLaughlin. I was going to say, I, really? Dollar store version. The, the, the yes, Netflix yes. Uh, straight to streaming version of the blockbuster. You know, not like Transformers, yes. but like Transmorphers. <laughs> uh, 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 John O'Neill's brother Damon O'Neill would tag along. <laughs> <laughs> and they would also get this Yank vocalist named Steve Mack. The band is made up from former members of other Dairy bands. It's like The Undertones, Bam Bam, The Calling, and Dairy Hitmakers. Combined garage rock with its music. We go back, way back in time, to 1986, just a wee baby. John O'Neill had just split up with The Undertones. So he went home to Derry uh, in Ireland, his hometown, and he teamed up with fellow guitarist uh, Raymond Gorman. And they were going to work as DJs at the uh, Derry's Left Bank Club. You know, dream high, dream big. <laughs> so they, they would be inspired by the records that they would play DJing and they would form a band. So they would bring in McLaughlin, who was a former Undertone member. O'Neill would bring in his brother, Damien, who would, believe it or not, Damien O'Neill would turn down an opportunity to join Dex and the Midnight Runners oh. in order to join this band with his brother. Yeah, Whoops. yeah. He could have been Dex and the Midnight, my, Midnight Runners. He could have been set for life. I mean, <laughs> come on, Eileen. <laughs> All those hits afterwards, too. I mean, they just kept pumping them out. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, come on, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and also... I don't know any other decks in the Midnight Runner songs. I don't know any either. I'm dead honest with you. <laughs> I don't think they have any. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> That's because Damien O'Neill didn't join the band. All right. So they got the band together. They would move to London in 84... In order to work with Seattle-born Steve Mack, singer extraordinaire, who was at the time working at a pizzeria, like most great <laughs> singers do. <laughs> Can you believe they moved to London to work with a guy working at a pizzeria? Like, that must have been the greatest sell job of all time. <laughs> no, guys, I can't come to Northern Ireland, but you guys got to come here to London and work with me. No, we're going to be great. I'm a fantastic singer. Just meet me at Bill's Pizzeria um, <laughs> after 6, because I work till 6. <laughs> they would first be signed by Demon Records in 86 and release debut album Manic Pop Thrill. It would chart number one on the UK indie charts. Uh, it would get rave reviews and would get them a little bit more mainstream record deal 
And their second album, Babel, would actually break the UK Top 40 album chart. After the second album, they would start to get a little bit political. IRA stuff was said. I'm waiting, John, for you to break in with, and then they became big in Australia. Because we've had a real string going here <laughs> exactly. of people who are big in Australia. Well, you know, I can't say that their album sales weren't good in Australia, but I can't say they weren't bad either. <laughs> I am willing to bet that a band, um, that this band is prob probably did sell pretty well from Australia. <laughs> but unfortunately, after getting a little bit political and coming into their third album, John O'Neill would randomly announce his departure from the band. He would hang along, around long enough to record their third album, which people and critics wouldn't like. They would say it was confusing, kind of sucked. John O'Neill's heart wasn't into it. O'Neill leaves. Band members kind of shuffle around, including Damon O'Neill, you know, the guy that could have been famous with Dex and the Midnight <laughs> Runners. Yeah, he changes from bass, which he had moved to, to accommodate the band to his natural position as guitarist, taking over for his brother. Few other ships and, and moves around. And they would come out with their fourth album, Chem Crazy, uh, Chemi Crazy, which is produced by Scott Litt, who produced R.E.M.'s Green Album. So of course, this is going to be fantastic. They changed a little bit to an alt-rock style. Like, who needs John O'Neill, really? I mean, come no, on. I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, he was holding everyone back, actually. Exactly, exactly. Unfortunately, it would stall at about number 62 on UK charts and would be even more disappointing us on the sales end and would also lead to the end of their contract with Virgin Records. Lose mm -hmm. their contract as well. They would do a little bit more shuffling. They would fire bassist John Marchini. They had hired it as part of the shuffling because it was all his fault. Yes. I mean, it's always on the bassist's shoulders. I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, I, t I take that back. You know, I take that back. Hey, Sometimes the bassist is John the Mar <laughs> like Roger Waters. Yeah. Poor John Marchini. I mean, he had to fill Damian O'Neill's shoes <laughs> because he switched the guitar. So he had to fill Damian's shoes. And I mean, that guy could have been in Dex in the Midnight Runners. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1993, they released their fifth album, Fireproof, which would once again come full circle like their debut and reach number one on UK indie charts. Uh, but, you know, would still wouldn't perform very well as far as sales. And as a result, the band would break up in 94. So they would all do a bunch of other bands and projects like, you know, they all split off and join other bands, none of which really stuck out when I went through them. Like none of them jumped out to me. It was like, oh, and they became famous in this band. It was like, no, no, never heard of you. Never heard of you. In 2008, they got a reunion together and toured from 08 to 2010. 10. Now, mind you, when I say reunion, I mean all of the band members from the fifth album reunited, oh. not, not John <laughs> O'Neill. We don't need John O'Neill. It's not like the whole band went down the tubes as soon as John O'Neill checked out. But they would begin, and then 2012, Gorman, McLaughlin, Kelly, and o Damian O'Neill would start a new band. Screw you guys. Screw <laughs> that petrol emotion. We're going to start a new band, and that band is called The Everlasting Yeah. <laughs> Another great name. So that's your music. Unfortunately, why Dex and the Midnight Runners never went any further than Come On Eileen. See, they it, missed their it, opportunity. They, if only Damien. <laughs> they missed their opportunity. They should have followed the church and just focus all their effort on Australia. Yes. They'll, yeah. they'll literally listen to anything down there. Which, uh, to, to, be, to give the church credit, and I know I kind of blew them off because I literally just talked about them like two episodes ago. As of 2017, the church released their 25th studio album. Whatever kangaroos or whatever currency they use in Australia, <laughs> they're making a bank load of it down there. Whatever, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're loaded. They've got like a hundred million dungaroos, so they're set. <laughs> well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. It feels like we might be in unison, but also have enough differences here to start a little argument. <laughs> What's the short one? <laughs> <laughs> let's go give our final thoughts. All right, guys, we got to check the mailbag. We got an email that we got to check in with. And this is actually from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as we've mentioned before, we are kind of pre-recording some of these episodes. <laughs> so this one snuck in 
we weren't able to get it in for a line of fire, but we want to definitely want to talk about this because it has everything to do with the amnesia arc in our episode from a few weeks ago when we broke down the entire arc and where we stand with everything. So this starts off with, hey guys, love the podcast. Starting you a few months ago. I've been binging every chance I get now that I'm caught up. Great to hear the show from people who are seeing it for the first time, along with one who has seen it many times. Well, thank you, Tommy. <laughs> thank you for your, yeah. uh, your listening of the show. I've watched the entire run more times than I could count. The show came out when I was 11 and Sunny shaped what I think was cool to this day. The show was so big back then and we still see its influence on TV and movies today. Although I think they're a little underappreciated or don't get the credit I think that they are due. Anyway, great show and content related device. This is a solid point when it comes to cool and what you saw on TV. And one of the things that I, I roll back to Tommy was about TV is different now in the era of streaming. When it was on regular TV, there was this common thing that we all shared and this like cool character on tv helped shape like popular culture Uh uh-huh but it's not that way anymore because Mm -hmm. you can watch stuff on 95 different streaming networks plus regular tv plus also i think that it that nowadays the aspect of like everybody sits around together and watches something so the whole family you know what i mean like because everyone has streaming so i'm gonna watch like our kids watch something on their phone or they watch something over here it's not the same, but I was I was a child of the '80s, just like him, and that that's exactly. I thought that, that Sunny was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree. <laughs> I agree. I was a little later, so uh, it wasn't exactly Miami Vice, but I did find a love for Don Johnson with Nash Bridges. So even to the point where I have an email account in which I am listed as Don Johnson. So I actually <laughs> had that. I actually had that account pre-podcast. So even <laughs> before this podcast, I was pretending to be Don Johnson. One thing we can definitely agree on is that Don Johnson still just oozes cool. Oh, uh, yeah. He never loses that. No. Also, earlier oh, reviews yeah. are in on a Watchmen. Mm-hmm. For the people who have seen like the on-set takes stuff, they are head over heels in love with that show, by the way. So, oh, oh, I, I can't can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> The email goes on. I have some thoughts on the Burnett saga, Melissa. I personally do think Caitlin being killed and Sonny killing Hackman are a big part of the reason he was able to become Burnett so easily. He was grieving the loss of his wife, felt empty after getting the revenge on Hackman, and even though he had no memory of these things, he still had those feelings inside of him. He was in such a dark, angry place that I'm sure it made complete sense to him when he was told he was Burnett. See, I feel vindicated. (laughs) I told you <laughs> there is people out there that believe the same way I do. It is very funny the reaction See, to because I had su- we had suggested that yes. and we got some feedback that was also like no he got blown up. Yeah, like, no, there were some people that were like no, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it was the explosion. It's like okay, can we just like maybe we can like talk about this a little more and go no, it was the explosion. I feel like you're focusing on the wrong part. Did you hear the part in which he said? after he killed a, Hackman. A Hackman. So it's agreeing with me that it was clearly murder. No, he, he murdered he Hackman. Him. That wasn't self-defense. He says no. kill uh-uh. Hackman. No, that doesn't mean it's the way he killed him. Definitely that implying is- murder. <laughs> well, John was continuing on the train. He also says, I do wish that he was Burnett for a longer because Don Johnson did such a great job. It was really compelling to see this broken man keeping up with his cold, calculating front while fighting these flashes of memory. I slowly start to show what kind of man he really was. He's not that way. No, One. <laughs> One, that is a fantastic description. Two, see, I'm telling you, we needed like 10 or 12 or 15 episodes of Evil Burnett before we we, we, we got rid of him. We just, they wasted so many excellent episodes of Burnett just murdering people and taking over <laughs> drug cartels. <laughs> last little section here says, one thing I wanted to mention, you'll notice that Crockett's style changes a lot in the last season. Ripped jeans, denim jacket, leather jackets, t-shirts with holes in them, not to mention his hair getting more and more shaggy. I like to think that this, that this was a conscious decision by the production and maybe even Don himself. I think they wanted to show that subconsciously Sonny wanted to distance himself so much from the suit wearing ponytailed Burnett that he went completely the opposite way, almost not caring how he dressed or looked. I've always thought that and I'd like to hear what you guys think. Anyway, keep up with the great show. Thanks. Thank you, Tommy. This last section I want to point out, I totally missed that. And in Line of Fire, I read this email and then Line of Fire was getting ready to be published. I uh-huh. went back and looked and like, 
he is he yeah. looks like he just came out of a dumpster. Yeah, no, he does. I mean, like huh. when would Sonny ever go to court wearing a denim jacket and it's got a holes share in it. On, yeah, his, the shirt he's like wearing all... has a huge hole in it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I feel like he he was done. Like he's also putting out there that he's done doing that life, doing that high roller, like wearing the fancy suit. He didn't want to do that portion anymore. I guess I missed the old uh, Canadian tuxedo. So <laughs> Um, I don't know. Maybe the recents have made him feel more connected to uh, old uh, Texas Ranger Willie. You know? <laughs> I did pay attention to it, and then I was floored when I went back and looked at I Had a Fire again. And I saw, as I was getting the pictures ready to go for our Instagram and stuff, he is really shaggy in the mm-hmm. hair. His clothes are really beat up. And I think when I watched the episode... That episode, I was thinking, oh, this must be because it's the metal episode. Yeah, I know. And the week before when he's, or in mm. bad timing a few weeks ago when he's on the motorcycle, he's wearing the suit on the motorcycle. Yeah, that is true. But but it yeah. continues on with the shaggy hair and the not wearing the suits and stuff like that because, you know, it, it just continues on like that. And it's funny to me that it's like him and Switek switched. That's why Tech started wearing suits. <laughs> <laughs> where where do you think he got the the clothes, like the jeans with the the holes in them and stuff, or do you think he bought them that way? Oh, I think he bought them that way. We've <laughs> never seen jeans, you know. I mean, in five years, so did he just I, have them in the back of his closet? Or I'm suspecting that the vice team has cut off his high fashion budget. Now he has to buy his own clothes. So the goodwill we go. Yeah, I mean, when you do go around murdering people, it puts a damper on your budget. <laughs> They're like, yeah, no, we're not going <laughs> to. The police aren't giving him any money. Well, Tommy, thanks again for your email. We really appreciate you writing in, and we would love to hear from more of you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. All right, Melissa, I want you to kick off this I week. I knew you were going to go to me. <laughs> of course I was. What are your final thoughts on this episode? I think it's a great episode. It's well written, It's it makes sense. The story has some twists and turns, which makes it good. It's not just a usual hooker story. <laughs> you know, the usual hooker story on Miami Vice. But I feel bad for Trudy that she always has to be the one to do all the dirty work for everybody. Literally, she does all the dirty work at the station. She types everything up. She looks everything up. And now she has to be the one to torture people and also be tortured in the same time. But, I mean, I think the storyline was good. And I, to be honest with you, before we watched the episode, I always forget about this episode. Like, I've seen it a bunch of times, but I always forget. And then I was like, oh, like, oh, okay. I'm sure this one's going to be one of those forgettable ones that that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But it, it does, and it is a good episode. And it finishes out with, you get an ending. You know what happens. There's no, like, leaving you hanging. And there's no going to be any, there's not going to be any, like, follow-up or crossover or anything like that. It's closed. You're done. Except for Carlos coming back as someone else. <laughs> Except for that part, but. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? I liked it. I mean, from the very get-go, we get full involvement with the team. And it's a heavy Trudy episode. And I love Trudy. And I love Trudy episodes. So, like, I was into it from the beginning. I thought it was a good storyline as far as, you know, someone's killing hookers. And, you know, and everything was going and flowing well. We had good police work going on. We had the, the ladies were in involved and and stan and everybody i was just disappointed with the ending because it felt way too much like the serial killer we had before with all the dolls he was was, he was literally doing the same thing with the dolls that this guy was doing with the mannequins it's like they couldn't come up with anything original that bugged me there and then Don, what you said with Crockett, the way he treats Trudy at the end of the episode, everything was going so well. And then the end of the episode kind of blew it for me a little bit. It was way too much like the other serial killer we had. And then all of a sudden it, it was just like, like those episodes kind of merged together for me. And on a side note, from a guest star and music perspective, this is a little light of an episode. But it has been noticeable in season five, we have not had the same caliber guest stars as far as star power that we've had the previous seasons. The music's been pretty pretty much the same. We're still getting a good mix of music, but guest stars is is definitely taking a step back, I kind of feel. really liked the episode. I really liked the first five-sixths of the episode. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I'm from my perspective, I'm going to say this is a great episode. And now I'm going to say this with, while saying I'm looking at things differently. This episode popped up in a weird time for me. 
because A, I'm really into near noir stories. I love those storylines. And we just watched Against All Odds, which is a neo noir yes, yes. film. So, and also, I'm still like, you know, swooning over Jeff Bridges from Friday. So, oh, you can swoon. <laughs> he looks, he's so swoon worthy in that movie. <laughs> so, this is a really good episode. Uh, and the number one reason why this is a really good episode, it involves everybody. Everybody has a role, everyone has a reason to be involved with them. E- all of them even have speaking lines. That's just standing in the background. <laughs> they all talk. They all have something. To uh-huh. They're all working on something. They all work together, especially Tubbs, who works with everybody. Apparently, no one else can get along except for with Tubbs. So that's everybody's the- car was in the shop except Tubbs. Like he was giving everyone <laughs> rides. <laughs> so that's the best part about this episode, is, and that's been the complaint about the end of season four, and then the first like six episodes of season five, because six episodes in the se- season five we had. Four Crockett episodes and two Castillo episodes. So literally no one else was involved. So now we get to Asian Cut and everyone on the team is involved. Everyone's heavily involved. Everyone has their own spin on the things that that they're working on. And it's Trudy. Trudy is the best cop on the force. And Trudy always gets the job done. And Trudy is seriously the best. We always love Trudy episodes. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about Trudy episodes, especially this one. What is your favorite Trudy episodes and where do you think this one fits? We had some things that we nitpicked over here, not necessarily like being a bad story, but about what's up with Sunny giving her the how could you do this kind of look. Let us know what your thoughts on the are on that kind of thing, especially what John's saying about the mannequins. Does that bother you like it bothers John? <laughs> Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goalwiththeheat.com. Find all the ways to subscribe, all the ways that you can contact us. Like I mentioned in the beginning, we've had a bunch of new people follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You want to find our Instagram? Go to that website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can find the links to all of those things. You can also find the ways to support us. Support step number one, go leave us a review on your podcast, your platform of choice, especially iTunes. That would be a big help for us to help people find the show if you could go leave us a review on iTunes. Just go ahead and give us five stars. No one's going to know that I told you to give us five stars, but don't write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead, write in that review what your favorite role is of Sandy in this episode, but she still has more coming as she was with (laughs) Hackman before. What's your favorite role of hers? Write that review right there inside of that inside of iTunes instead of writing your real review. Support step number two. Check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. You can find all the ways that you can support us. This show is coming to an end as far as Miami Vice goes. And we would love to continue to do that. We would love to see your support. And just launched this week on Patreon, a brand new show that is a Patreon exclusive. That is an extended version of This Week in Vice. So if you love our This Week in Vice companion show that talks about everything that was going on in the 80s when this show aired, when this ep- when this episode aired, subscribe to that Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You get access to all the bonus content, including the brand new This Week in Vice extended version. And you get all the episodes early and you can get a custom RSS for all of the custom stuff that comes to your Patreon. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.